Welcome back everybody, this is Brother Meat here. Today we are finishing our tutorial. Also going to get you guys to level 2 today. That's actually very easy to do. Uh, you basically just do the tutorials and you do the very first thing that they ask you to do, which is basically go to the council. After the council um, deputizes you, you're literally made level 2. This is actually something, uh, as far as games are concerned, that I actually appreciate. It's one of the, the worst parts of like Pathfinder, especially on the hard difficulties, is going through the, the huge ass tutorial all over again and actually uh, taking it all the way until you get two O-Legs to get to level two. Now, there's ways around that. Like, you can shut off XP share. You can actually get your main character to level two sooner. But this is a, a thing about this game that I actually kind of appreciate. I never understood, uh, to rant a little bit here, why the hell in uh, pen and paper D&D, &D, adventurers, especially like a wizard, no less, someone that, that requires specific amounts of training to be viable, is literally, you know, thrown to the fucking wolves, so to speak, at level one they got like the worst fucking health ever they got like a spell and some cantrips it's like fucking really what the hell kind of boss would do that to some i mean, rant over point is i actually kind of like this part of the game so let's actually get into it we got the tutorial part two saved here let's jump in shall we uh, so this is the fourth part uh, of the, the four part tutorial this is the one that literally shows you how to be a rogue or to use rogue-like elements in this game. So you have the ability to basically stealth and pick pockets, disarm traps, and shit of this nature. And the tutorial will actually walk you through this shit. Notice uh, someone had actually pointed out my previous video, because I mentioned how the hell this actually works if you don't make a rogue on your team of four, which of course is a silly idea, but you could do. Apparently what the game does, and I haven't tested this myself, so I'm actually going from what a commenter said. But I believe them. They, they take the person on your team that has the highest dexterity and or any skills that are rogue based. You know, so like if you have like the proficiency in picking locks or, you know, picking pockets and shit of that nature, they'll make that character go through the rogue tutorial. That's not the worst idea ever. It's not the best idea ever, honestly. Uh, but if anything, uh, uh, positives, we love positives, positive, positive, positives are always a positive. So, think, so let's talk about positives. This would be a good way for them to emphasize, in my opinion, you probably want a rogue, right? If you can't get through the tutorial without causing some problems because they literally are showing you you're going to come into traps, you're going to have to sneak, you're going to have to pick pockets on occasion to fucking get that magic key or whatever. This is something that a rogue excels at. If you don't have someone that's capable of doing that kind of shit, then you probably need to restart the game and make that rogue character, right? Or at least, again, someone that has enough skills to be a rogue without the title of a rogue. And I like the fact that this game has four uh, characters on the team. And yes, there's times where you'll get like an extra party member or two, whatever, that fucking just show up to help out. But they're temporaries. We're talking about the core team of four. And the reason I like that, for anyone that's ever played Pathfinder, you always wonder why the hell you got a team of six and that's awesome. And everything at a certain point just starts to melt at your feet. It's because six is a ridiculous number. In the old pen and paper version of the D&D, I mean, it used to be a fucking challenge to get enough friends together to actually get... To a team of fucking four and i'm old school so the old i mean D, D before it was like even advanced dungeons and dragons we're talking you had like the fighter the thief because rogues didn't exist uh you had magic user because no one fucking knew that wizards and sorcerers were a thing apparently so magic user was the third category and then you had cleric that was it that was your team of four baby and, you know they added paladins and rangers and druids and all the other fucking fancy shit later sorcerers too but really that was your team of four and if you fall under those traps even something again like this party of mine doesn't have a cleric they have a paladin right that's not a cleric clearly not a cleric not even remotely good enough to be a cleric but it's good enough to do what i'm going to need so again you got a healer of some kind you got someone that can basically pick locks and disarm traps and all that fucking sneak shit that a rogue does awesome you got a uh, dps whether it's ranged or melee or both that's your fighter and paladin and rogue in my opinion and then you have a, a, a magical caster an arcane caster of some kind in our case a wizard and yes i'm gonna have a rogue that has some wizardly ability and i'll have a fighter that has some wizardly ability that's it and that's more than enough i think to do what i'm going to want to do in this game okay second rant over wow that's a lot of rants i'm getting good at this this is just letting us know how to actually uh go into cautious mode and that when you go into cautious mode and start looking around, you have a zone of influence that basically is um, uh, how much sound you're making. And if bad guys fall within this bubble that you're basically emitting, then they're going to hear your ass. 
Uh, also, if they can look at you, and like you like say this tree was them, they're looking right at you. Don't fucking try to sneak up on them going this way, because they're gonna fucking see you. You're not invisible. You are literally a dumbass if you think that you're gonna just like walk up on shit. Uh, notice here we got the camera tutorial again, just letting us know how to rotate some stuff. And again, we have these tools. Not that we didn't have them, but why waste your own? So, again, we also have crafting basic poison. Crafting basic poison. I'll show you how to use these here actually in a moment. Uh, so look, give us over here. You follow the tracks, you follow the tracks. And I love the fact that they've added this little part, too. I thought that's kind of cute. Um, and can only really be spotted well, or at all, by stealthing, by being cautious, basically. Let's actually uh, talk about that part of our tutorial here that they're not really telling us. Crafting basic poison. Okay, see that we have this book the piece of paper document whatever you want to call it hold alt to get more information read this manual to learn how to craft the basic poison item and that's all it is either right click it read it you use it and this is how to craft five poisonous arrows you require scarn powder blood daffodil galavan amaranth and an angry violet that's it that's all you got to do now we have another one and i got a feeling that this is going to be the same guy Crafting basic poison. Yeah, it doesn't say anything different. And again, I'm not going to use it on the off chance that I need to actually uh, give it to someone else on my party and have them read it to see if it adds to their book. That's something we'll save. If not, then we've got duplicates for silly ass reasons. Uh, notice that we have basic poison. Hold alt to read more information on this. It's consumable, apply on target item, and like a weapon. And it gives a uh, uh, 1d4. That's what that four symbol is. That's a four sided die. 1d4. Of, of what I'm assuming that icon means poison damage, save to negate. So obviously if they save against the saving throw on this thing, then they won't take any extra damage. But this is a nice way for you to basically buff your weapon and add a little damage. Uh, I don't think you can add it to arrows, but I don't know that off the top of my head. And it specifically said we can make poison arrows. Notice how we have first category of weapons or ammunition and a second category. So again, you can store a different type of weapon um, amulet here. Uh, so again, like if we had arrows and magic arrows, or magic arrows and poison arrows, cold arrows versus fire arrows. You get the idea. So again, very cool. And then again, notice how she has a rapier, but she can't use it. You see that? So literally, if I'm trying to drag it here, why won't it use it? Because she literally doesn't have skill in this one. Uh, let's see, does actually tell us this? Piercing is melee, finesse. It's a martial weapon. See how it says martial? It's not a simple weapon like her daggers, and she is double wielding daggers, so she's going to get extra stabity stabity attacks, ideally. Uh, let's get back into the tutorial, shall we? Notice that the the footprints lead up to here. Push, uh, click to push this object. Okay. This is how your friend, who basically is snuck into this camp that you've yet to realize, uh, got in here and basically is helping you out figure out how to get through this area. Now notice if we, have, if we press tab. We zoom back into our character. Oh, and we have guards up on the tower up here. So we gotta be careful. Didn't even see that bastard last time I did this. So we're going up to the door here. We'll get another part of the tutorial. To try picking a lock, mouse over a locked door or chest and left click. If you select your whole party, the most skilled character is automatically chosen for the task. You must have these tools in your inventory to try picking a lock. Being proficient with these tools will help. Obviously something that rogues would have, but you don't have to be a rogue is the point. Nice, roll the 20. Uh, let me check against DC 10 rolls, 20 plus 8 is success. Okay, moving to the next zone. Tutorial, sleight of hand. If you are proficient with sleight of hand, you can attempt to pick pocket enemies and NPCs. Also, certain armors give you disadvantage on stealth checks. This is always risky, so think twice before trying it. You must be very stealthy to stand a chance. Uh, this is another part of the tutorial that, again, I appreciate. It's giving you ad advice that, well, you didn't ask for it, and it's not really that hugely important. It's, it's kind of a no-brainer move where they say, you know, armor is a penalty sometimes. So, being a, a knight or paladin fighter or whatever that's wearing full fucking plate mail or chain mail or some shit that's going to be clinky clanky tinky tanky into an area and then you try to like i'm gonna go pick this guy's pocket because i have a high dexterity and you know maybe that's your thing yeah you're not going to be successful because of the armor penalties right and that's what this is basically driving home here which again i think is kind of cool that they actually make a, a specific point of, of telling you that shit even if it is something that everyone would clearly understand for someone that's never played these games 
it's nice. And again, I, I think it's a nice inclusion, uh, way to be inclusive, if you will, for people that are completely new to the genre. That are like, hey, what's this D&D thing I hear all about? And, and they would say, let's get it on the computer. And here you go. They walk you through some of the basic shit that we've known since we were fucking kids. But now you know as well. And I kind of dig that shit. So, the reason that you need to pick pockets uh, for this particular tutorial is there is a key that we need. You see this uh, bandit quartermaster? He's got the key. I'm going to sneak into the area, but I want you to see something else. This is going to show you another cool mechanic. See how he's facing away from us? Easy peasy, right? Yeah, look at this guy over here. He's also facing away. When is he going to turn around and start facing us? That could be the problem. See that? So again, if he starts turning on us, we're going to be screwed. So actually, before we do anything, let's do a quick save on this. Let's save it there. Sure, why not? Ah, this little bastard. He can't see us because, again, we're being all super sneaky, quiet, and stealthy. And that's our zone of making noise, and it's dark, presumably. We're hiding in the shadows, so to speak. I wish they actually had a shadow icon cover. That'd be an easy mechanic I think they could have added, but whatever. Can't have everything. Left hand, success, we got the golden key. Knows how we had to get out of there because we were making noise. Right? So it's time to make GTFO once you get your shit done. I notice back over here. There's other bad guys over here. Unknown creature, unknown creature. They're defensively standing or whatever. But they're so far away from us they can't really see us, even though we got this big ass fucking torch light. I wish they would have added another mechanic too of snuffing out lights. I think that would have been a fucking cool thing. Uh, before we go into our actual place of where we're going, I want you to see that there is stuff in these maps that you can interact with, just like we had on the other video, I think. There was moss that we could interact with. Well, this is another interactable bush. And this gives us from the angry bush, ooh, angry, angry violet times two, and that's an ingredient. Again, if you alt, I'll tell you more information. Common in the Principality of Mascarth, this flower is named after a famous wizard. Angry or violet, I'm not sure. Point is, it's ours now. And again, it's probably one of the things that's part of our crafting. Let's see if we actually know that. Oh, arrow, crossbow bolt. Poisonous, see the craft five poisonous arrows. Yeah, see, angry violet. See, it even gives you a nice little green check mark, letting you know you have two of one. And the duration for crafting is 16 hours, and there's a DC check on it. We still need scar and powder, blood daffodil, and galavan amaranth, which we do not have, but we do have um, poisoner's kit, medicine, or nature is one of those proficiencies to make this shit. Poisoner's kit, something that we have. Nature skill is something that we have. Medicine skill, we don't have on this character. Point is. There's multiple people that can uh, literally craft that item is what I'm basically trying to drive home here. So again, just because it's poison doesn't mean that the cleric or the, the paladin that has some serious fucking skill in medicine can't figure out how to poison your ass. Now that we got all that, we'll clearly climb in up here. Yes, hop in. Wait, a trap. Look, it's a target. Uh, let's see, so we're going over here. Uh, one thing I don't like is you can't force your character to face a specific way. It just bugs me. I know it doesn't matter. It's just, you know, you're facing this way, but the trap's that way. I really wish that they would allow us to, like, drag and orient the, the, the way your character's facing. Uh, notice this. Uh, to disarm a trap, you must first detect it. If you try to open or lockpick a chest with a trap that you haven't detected, you only find out about the trap when you trigger it. That sucks. To try disarming a trap, mouse over it and left click. You will need to make a successful dexterity check. These tools will help if you are proficient with them. Uh, next. Some traps can only be disarmed by triggering them. Pay close attention to this statement. Literally, if the trap can't be uh, uh, disarmed by any character, whether it's your rogue or someone else, you will literally trigger a trap. So either A, find another way around, or B, don't send the character that has one, one fucking hit point to just trigger the trap, because at that point, anyone can fucking trigger the trap. If it just helps progress the the uh, path of where you're walking, I suppose, that's why you would do that. So when you see a trap, my advice to you is to do quick save, which I can't remember how to actually quick save, but I do know we can save. So for instance, come over here, and I will save. Escape, save game. Save one of the tutorial again. Yes, I want you to write over it. Thank you. But I think we can actually disarm this trap. Just needed one hand. Nice. 
Jeez. Good work, Kettle. He's crushing it today. Okay. Anyone in here? Anybody? 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 Bueller? Bueller? Cool. All right. Something else that I like about this game. Let's see if I can show you something cool. So you notice outside, uh, we have an issue seeing the, the, the various trees and grass. As we walk past here, you'll notice that we actually uncover more. We're presumably looking out the window, which I think is a nice little touch. I mean, again, it's just not amazing to add stuff like that, but it shows attention to detail. This is something that, again, I think the devs are really crushing it on this game. They go out of their way to make this an interesting game. And the fact that that is part of the game, for those that are going to try to do... Um, what did I just do? Uh, did I make too much noise or something? There we go. Um, there is uh, Liam's heirloom. Let's alt to find out what this thing is. It is a 500 gold piece fucking ruby. He may not be a friend anymore. Uh, what was I saying? Uh, couldn't have been that important. It'll come back to me. Though, the attention to detail. I appreciate the fact that the, the devs have the attention to detail. It shows that they give a shit about this game. There you are, you filthy crook! You? That's not what your friend. What? You're drunk. Get out of here before I kill you. Think you scare me? Not anymore. A grave mistake. Why does that voice sound familiar? I'm talking about the bad guy. Who is that? Oh, that's gonna bug me. I swear, it's, it sounds like a, a voice actor from, like, Batman or something. It's going to come to me someday. Anyway, uh, tutorial critical characters. Now, this is important to pay attention. Sometimes in the course of your adventure, some non-player characters or NPCs may become critical. This means if you let them die, game over. So this dude is your buddy. You can't let him die. If you attack an enemy while undetected, like we are right now, you gain the advantage of surprise. That means you have advantage on your roll to hit, and your opponent cannot react before the next turn. No counterattack or not block blocking it with his special abilities. If you are a rogue, your attack will be a sneak attack, dealing additional damage. And we are a rogue, conveniently. The battle starts. Die roll! 13, 11, 20. Ooh, Shadowcaster kicking ass. Lone Shark, you rolled a goddamn three. You suck wind, bro. Alright, um... I've yet to figure out what the red means. Uh, so if anyone knows what that shit is about, let me know. Uh, I would assume that that's bad. Red usually is bad, green or blue is usually good, so uh, I'm not a fan of that. Notice how we do have a dash action. And we can click that, and now we have access to this doofus all the way to here. I'm going to go here. Maybe it's because that, that will be where we can not uh, attack him with sneak attack. He'll see us. So let's actually go here. Oh, that's that guy right there. Very nicely done, team. Are you four here to see Lord Karen? Oh, I am. Uh, who's asking? Depends on who's asking. Well, if you're here for Lord Karen of the Legacy Council, that would be me. That was a weird way to introduce yourself. Are you looking for this guy? Yes, I'm him. Huh? Okay. Uh, so you're real then, we should get paid for waiting, we're ready, we're ready. Then we are here at your service, sir. Very good. Can you tell us more about the job? Well, I suppose it's better if you know what you're doing. What do you want to know? Mm, yeah, we're good, thank you. I'm not gonna spoil this, it's not spoiling. If the game is early, I don't give a shit. But, uh, when well, does it get to the point, so we're good, thank you. We should go, don't you think? Very well. Come, gather your things. You're late for your swearing in. Hurry up and wait. The story of my life. Now, what this is going to do is, is this, uh, right after the tutorial, this is going to take you to your first uh, meeting of the council. The council is going to deputize your ass. And after that, literally, you're level two. You need to go take a long rest to activate that uh, level two. And you pick your level and et cetera and so forth. There is no uh, multi-classing in this game, as far as I can tell. Uh, so you, literally, you're a fighter and you're continuing to be a fighter. No, there's... 
cross specializations and stuff. Again, like my spell sword is going to be a, a fighter that has wizard abilities, but ba that's basically it. Uh, the Principality's capital is a large city. Right now, you need to find the Legacy Council. Once you've been there, you'll have access to the fast travel function, but for now, you'll have to walk a little. Go north and up the stairs to Sun Blaze Court, then take the stairs west to the council. Understood. And again, you can reread that if you need to. Notice we have a compass. Click our characters. And this is basically north. Going this direction. Okay? So we're headed north. Over here to the west is our stairs. Come on, guys. Going this way. Also, if you get lost, feel free to press M and pop up your map. I do love the maps in this game. The 3D maps in this thing are fucking tits. Shows you where characters are at. This would be your fast travel ability. Like if you want to go to the Graveskeeper, clicking that will take you there. You'll see items that you haven't actually picked up or looted or whatever. That's something for later. Uh, people of interest to talk to. Major Gate Officer. Chaplain Dahl. Dahl Lark. Mayor Kyrdeth Bright Spark. Captain Veriza, Iron Shell, Priestess Apocra, Sunblaze Court. And again, Sunblaze Court was where we're going. And then we were told to go up the stairs, which is this way. Again, as we progress this way, it pauses when you go to the map. I just was, sorry, I was just checking to make sure. Uh, pauses when you go to the map. So if you ever need to pause the game to get a, your bearings a little nice bit, uh, just hit M. Now again... You see that we have our Snow Alliance Embassy, we have a Hallman Summer, a Priest of Mariak, and we have a Galavan Embassy Guard, and of course the Legacy Council with a big old exclamation point. Clearly this is where we're headed. I never thought I'd get so close to the embassies. What? What? Oh, that's pretty. Look at the size of this council hall. So this is what they spend our taxes on. Look! Is that the princess? Hey, hey, princess! Is she leaving? Apparently so. Then who will administer the oath? And who will give me my handy? What the actual hell, lady? No, I'm just kidding. All right. Uh, we're too low for her. It's not her role. Yeah, uh, right. The devotee. It's not her role. She would not actually probably know this information. There's an oath keeper for that, I think. You yeah. thought it would be the princess? No. It's been nice. It was. She doesn't rule the council. Doesn't she lead the council? No. In this chamber, she's just another delegate. Lady Keen, the council's oath keeper, is trusted by all. Lord Caron. Yes, my lady. Are these your new deputies? They are, my lady. My name is Lyra Keen, oath keeper of the council. Shush. Quiet, everyone. And I will be administering your vows. Once sworn in, you will carry the authority of the council wherever you go. Your every action will reflect upon the Council's reputation. Remember that. Always. Now, please, raise your right hands. Right hand. You, each and all, solemnly swear your lives and allegiance to this Council and promise to carry forth our mission to protect our Alliance from any who would threaten the common good. I do. I swear. I swear. I swear. That's what Excellent. I meant. Lord Caron will enter your name into the Council's register. Thank you for your service. Congratulations, deputies. Wait, that's it? Uh, you're expecting a parade that was long enough. Yeah, let's focus on the mission. Yeah. Stop wasting time. What's the mission? Well, a motivated deputy. So, the mission. As I'm sure you know, the council maintains a number of outposts to secure the border between the principality and the marches. One of them is the former Imperial <coughs> Fortress, KLM. It's held by some 50 troops under the command of Captain Henrik. He sends us weekly status reports, or rather, he used to. We haven't heard a word from him in three weeks. Leave immediately for KLM and find out if anyone there is still alive. If Captain Henrik or anyone else is still breathing, bring him back. The Council wants a first-hand report. All right, uh, spoke with the marches. Tell us about Captain Henrik. Sounds dangerous. I'm going to skip all this stuff because we'll do this in the actual playthrough. I just want to get you guys to level enough. So we're good to go. Right. I guess that's that. It's on to KLM. Notice that our reputation just increased. That's what this tutorial is about. 
the five factions. The five council factions have representatives in Kaer Kai Flynn. They can sell you equipment, spells, and many other things. No idea who's better at what, but I would assume that there's going to be a council a faction that's a wizardly faction, and as such, suck their asshole, basically do their side quest and what have you, and you will increase in reputation. But read this part here. The better your relationship with the faction, the more they have to offer, and the lower their prices. However, this is key. These factions are in, in competition with each other, which means you can't please them all. Various subquests will give you opportunities to improve your relationship with one faction or another. Keep an eye on the faction section of the journal. Next. Press the map button to open the location map. When a waypoint uh, has been found, you can use it to fast travel to another place in the location. For now, you can use fast travel to return to the grave keeps cask. Understood. Now, you don't have to go there right away, but you'll notice that you have this cool exclamation or, uh, arrow up here. The character is ready to level up. Take a long rest to start the level up sequence. Well, obviously, we need a long rest, so go to the map, and we zoom out. Go back to that uh, grave keeps cask, and we can actually get ourselves a fast travel here. Yes, uh, zippy, and we're now here. So again, we can talk to him. He has some other information as well, but by and large, I'm just going to say. Hello, adventurers. Me what can I offer you? Give me a room for the night. We need a room. We'd like to stay for the night. Sure. Just walk up to the suite and settle in. A suite? Oh, uh, it's more like a large bedroom, really. But you know, this is the capital city. They just charged me ten fucking gold pieces for a suite. Fuck you, that's a lot of money. So here's our level up process, okay? So you've, you've done your long rest, and much like preparing your spells, this will be where you also level up. So notice that it's level up and prepare spells at the same time. So do your level up, obviously, first. Level up. Our wizard, level two. Terrible amount of hit points. Notice we get our specialization at higher levels. If you click this, you'll see more information about what your your chosen vocation gives you. At level 4 we'll get an ability score uh, choice and at level 8 we'll do it again or a bonus feat. Now having said that, I don't know what kind of feats are in the game. I assume the traditional ones you know, like martial weapon proficiency, armor proficiency, shield proficiency, uh, maybe a, a weapon focus with a specific weapon. Uh, I don't know that they have meta magic in this game. I can't imagine that they do. And we're capped at level 10 uh, wizard anyway. Best case scenario, so that's like level 5 spells anyway, so I'm probably not going to invest in that. But there are some feats in D&D, &D, in 5th edition specifically, uh, that, if they've imported them into this game, um, instead of giving you like a 2 point increase to like a specific stat, you know, like say we want to increase our dexterity from 15 to 17, we can do that. Or we can take a bonus feat, and some of those bonus feats are increase your dexterity 1 point. And as you can see, I have an odd number in a couple of them, so a 1 point increase is still a good upgrade. And... I still get a feat plus as well, so something else that comes with that feat. So that's something to look into. But that's all we got for him. Next, now notice that we have Green Mage, Lord Master, and Shock Arcanus. This is the one I'm getting because that's what this bastard gives us. At level 6, Arcane Fury, you add your proficiency bonus and intelligence bonus to your evocation spell damage for one minute. Recharges after a long rest, so one a day kind of deal. This is highly useful for burning down heavy hitting targets, like a, like a boss fight. This would be what you kind of save this fucker for. Notice we also get, right now, Arcane Warfare at level 2. When casting spells from the war list, which I'll read to you in a second, they count as being cast at one slot level higher. Now remember, we can only cast level 1 spells right now. We're level 2 wizard. Your spell slots unlock at 1, or sorry, your next level spells lock at 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9. That'll be our level 5 spells at, at level 9 with extra slots at the levels in between. Basically, at level 2, we're still stuck at level 1 spells. However, for these following spells, Burning Hands, Magic Missile, Thunder Wave, Acid Arrow, which we can't get to level 2, Scorching Rays at level 2, Flaming Spheres at level 2, Fireball level 3, Lightning Bolts is level 3, Ice Storm and Cone of Cold is level 4 and 5, I believe, respectively. So, that's a laundry list of fucking spells, but they're cast as a one uh, spell slot level higher. Which means we're not burning a spell slot level 2 to cast a, a magic missile to get level 2 effect. What that does for magic missile just gives you an extra fucking arrow. But again, it's an extra arrow of damage. And again, right now, that's free for him. Always. So, all these level 1 castings, the burning hands, the magic missile, the thunder wave, those are all being cast as an upcast. And that's pretty fucking cool. Hence, the Shock Arcanus is probably going to be my favorite, at least of the vanilla version of this game. Notice we can uh, pick two more spells. These ones are already done. Uh, so it's two spells to learn. What two spells will be like. Uh, 
Burning Hands, Charm Person, Color Spray, Exodus's Retreat, False Life, Feather Fall, Fall Cloud, Hideous Laughter, Jump, Protection versus uh, Evil and Good, Sleep Spell, that's amazing, Thunder Wave is also interesting, let's actually look at that with an Alt button to show you something else. Notice this part, removes on fires, because it puts out fires. Sustain continuous fire damage unless the fire is extinguished by an action. This would extinguish that action. So again, if you've been put on fire, you can Thunder Wave, I believe, and you make the fire go away. There's also fire placed in certain environments. And as such, if you want to get to the other fucking side without setting your team asses on fire, a Thunder Wave spell might, might, I haven't tested this, get rid of that fire. So hence, something of utility. I'm taking that one. Now what else to take? There's a lot of good stuff here. There's no wrong answer. And again, as soon as we find these spells in a spell book, or a scroll, we'll probably scribe them to our book. There is a check for that, uh, so know that that's not a guaranteed thing, but it's still something that would, should, as a wizard, be something we do to flesh out our book. So don't feel bad if you're like, oh, I want this, but I also want that. You pick what you pick, man. Thunderwave's AoE, so I don't really feel the need to get burning hands right now, but there could be some environmental interactions on setting shit on fire. Uh, it doesn't say anything about it other than it's fire damage, 3d6 of fire damage, so that's pretty nice and safe for half damage. I do like the visuals that they have for 3D animation here for the spray of cone of fire in front of you where at the very top where it shows you what the cone kind of is going to look like for the area of effect. That's pretty fucking cool. Um, so again, we could do that when Thunder Wave is an AOE centered on the caster, I'm assuming. So obviously don't cast that when your team's near because I don't think it distinguishes between good versus bad or team versus non-team. So that's of concern. Notice how Magic Missile is over here, though. You see that? Uh, I'm sorry. Never mind. We picked that stuff thoroughly. These ones... Um, are grayed out simply because we already have them in our book. Uh, what's our other spell then? Moving around. We're going to get Fog Cloud, Feather Fall could be a value, uh, False Life, some Temp HP. How long does that one last? One hour. It doesn't say. Um, oh, there it is. The spell effects 1d4 plus 4 temper hit points. So 5 to 8 Temp HP, which puts him on par with a terrible fighter ish character for health, anyway. Uh, maybe we want a Charm Person. This could come in handy if we're influencing people. They may have that as part of the, um, not a tutorial, as part of the interactions with certain people. Uh, let's prepare our spells. It's actually clear. Notice how we have six spells now that we can prepare in a day, not counting our infinite use cantrips, which are, again, still our firebolt, light, and shadow dagger. Uh, and again, I still maintain those are solid choices. We still see stuff centered on ourselves, obviously our weapon, what have you. Firebolt to shoot some shit. Uh, at distance, we could miss though. Uh, Shadow Dagger doesn't miss, but it's a saving throw potential uh, where it could completely ignore damage. For the six spells, again, we can't get all, so two have to go the way of the Dota, but let's do the obvious. We want a Mage Armor Shield and Magic Missile again. Armor, uh, reflective armor, and the ability to literally shoot something at some distance. Thunder Wave, we said we wanted for specific reasons, so that leaves us only two more. Now, notice Charm Person is not on my list uh, for things I'm going to pick today. But identify definitely will be because if something uh, can be identified as magic, I don't have to burn a spell slot because of this little icon here. This means it's a ritual. Same with comprehend languages and detect magic. I can cast any of those spells if I pick them, I think, for the day. So this is kind of a test for me. Uh, any time during the day, I can just say, fuck it, cast this spell as a ritual. We'll waste, burn basically 10 minutes and then poof, the spell will be cast. It will not burn a spell slot, which is fucking awesome. The question then is, uh, to me is, can I, for example, do Detect Magic if I don't click this little check mark here? And if that's the case, then that's awesome because then I don't need to even grab Identify. I can grab you know, whatever the fuck else I want. Um, but I think this has to be uh, equipped like we're seeing right now. So again, we won't be able to do Comprehend Languages or Detect Magic with this character as far as I can tell. Identify, we can do that either three times a day this way, the quick way, or take the 10-minute burn and just do it as a ritual. And that, I'm fairly certain, does work. So that one's done. Let's level up our devotee. This is our paladin. Yeah. He's got himself a nice amount of hit points. 24 hit points. Nothing to scoff at. Part of being a dwarf. Because, again, that gave us extra uh, HP at every level, if I'm not mistaken. And she has a good con stat besides. Notice how she has unlocked Divine Smite. Uh, so you can do extra damage. This will be, again, when you attack something, it'll say, Hey, you hit it. You want to Divine Smite it, too? Which means add extra damage. Again, it will burn a spell slot. Read this shit. You can spend one spell slot to do additional 2d8 uh, radiant damage to the target, plus 1d8 per slot level above first, plus 1d8 when hitting an undead or a fiend. So again, obviously made for killing undead, which is why she's part of the party. 
Notice we're getting a fighting style. That's going to be important here in a minute. And we finally unlocked Paladin Casting. At higher levels, we'll get the following. Level 3, Channel Divinity, Sacred Oath. So again, that's where I become a devotee, which is why that's her name. So Oath of Devotion will be the oath that I pick for her, based on what I've seen anyway. Um, ability score increases at 4 and 8, or bonus feat. Level 5, we get an extra attack, which is awesome. Level 6, we get an Aura of Protection. Grants a saving throw bonus to your surrounding allies, equal to your Charisma modifier. That's fucking tits. Plus 3 right now. Um, at level 10, we'll get Aura of Courage. You and your allies within 10 feet cannot be frightened while you are conscious. At 18th level, which doesn't exist in this game, the range becomes 30 feet. Bam. Awesome. Uh, next. Notice, this is her fighting style. Now, I'm going to go over each of these briefly, but just to, to walk you through what they do. Roughly. Defense. You're wearing armor. Plus one armor class. Don't scoff at extra armor. Solid choice. Dueling. Solid damage. If you're wielding a melee weapon in one hand and no other weapons, shield is not a weapon, then we get an extra bonus to our damage roll with that weapon. A plus two. That's a solid DPS build right now. Do it dueling. Notice great weapon fighting. When you roll a one or two on a damage die for an attack, you make with a melee weapon that you are wielding with two hands. So again, like a great sword, for example. You can re-roll the die. You must use the new roll even if it is a 1 or a 2. But we must have the two-handed or versatile property for you to gain this benefit. So versatile property apparently means that you can wield it two-handed. Which, uh, a longsword probably is one of those versatile weapons where you can choke up on it. But you'd probably need to have your uh, offhand free, which means no shield. So sword and board, or just the sword itself, can be choked up on as a versatile weapon, is my guess. And again, could be better damage. Could be better damage. But notice how dueling, as long as it's a one-handed weapon, we get a plus two, period. Not, I'm not a re-roll a one or a two and pick the whatever happens again, which could be worse or the same, or obviously better. Or we just can get a flat plus two all the goddamn time. So dueling sounds appealing. Great weapon fighting has its appeal, but it's not that interesting to me. Now let's go to the one I'm picking, and that's protection. When a creature you can see attacks a target other than you... That is within five feet of you, basically in the, the tile right fucking next to you. You can use your reaction to impose disadvantage on the attack roll. You must be wielding a shield, so sword and board all the way. Of course. The reason that that is important is because she literally um, is going to be standing up front. Now, whether it's right next to Brother Mutant to keep him fucking alive, next to the rogue so she can get around a sneak attack, or the spell sword, the fighter, that's going to be, you know, fucking toeing to toe it with uh, her and as well as the paladin. Again, she'll be protecting teammates. And it burns a reaction, sure. But what else were reactions used for? They're used in this game, but you don't always use them in this game, right? So again, if it one and done every fucking fight, you use that thing and it keeps them from fucking taking a hit, you're saving your team. That's your fucking goal. I mean, that's why you're the paladin. So let's prepare some spells. Notice that she has, let's clear all these, four spells to prepare. Now they have bless, cure wounds, detect evil and good. Heroism, Divine Favor, Detect Magic. And again, notice there's a ritual here. Um, protection versus Evil and Good. Shield of Faith. Well, I'm grabbing Shield of Faith. You better believe that. Uh, I'm going to take Cure Wounds because, again, while we have Lay on Hands ability, I think, right now, the ability to heal people is invaluable. So Alt, just to show you this. Notice how it's a range of touch. Verbal and Somatic Components. Yes, that's a thing in this game. Uh, 1d8 of healing plus ability bonus, which for her should be probably Charisma. Uh, maybe Wisdom, but... The yeah, point is, is she's, she's doing well on either of those, so again, some extra healing besides. Now, a purse spell slot over level 1, so basically upcasting is what I call that. So if she casts it, for example, say it's a level 2 spell, she'll get an extra die. So instead of 1d8, it's 2d8. Instead of uh, 2d8, it's 3d8 if she casts it as a level 3 spell. You get the idea. But notice this next part. No free hands to perform somatic spell components. So sorting and boarding it is not going to fucking do her a lot good. You can, however, switch weapons. Remember? And one of the weapons we switch to is just the candle in one fucking hand. So that would allow her to go candle in one hand, cast a spell with the other. Okay, be real clear on that shit. Heroism. This one gives temporary hit points. It says zero, so obviously that's weird. Um, so again, not one that I want to really test out. But this is something that I think is just a, a glitch they haven't typed it in officially. Um, divine Favor. A one minute buff for 1d4 additional radiant damage. I mean, that's pretty fucking significant damage. And again, we would need our spare hand free. This doesn't buff a weapon, this just buffs you. So again, you can switch to the candle, buff up, I believe, then switch back, which yes, that'll take another turn, and then for a minute you've got some extra fucking damage. Bless, on the other hand, is an AOE one, 
Uh, increase your ally saving throws and attack rolls for a limited time. Again, only one minute. Verbal, somatic, and material. Uh, doesn't say what the material component is. I'm assuming we need like beads or some shit. Uh, grants blessed. 1d4 to attack. 1d4 to saving throws. And it's a concentration spell. Buff concentration spell. See that? Uh, and again, plus one to target. Uh, per spell slot over level one, which means instead of 1d4, it'll be 1d4 plus one. 1d4 plus two. 1d4 plus three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I like bless. Uh, what else do I like? I like detect magic. We didn't have that on the other character. And uh, again, ritual. So again, because it's ritual, she can presumably cast this one now as a 10 minute ritual and not burn a spell slot because she only has fucking precious too. And remember, those two get used for uh, divine smite as well. So these burn up real fast. If you're not using them for spells, at least you can use it for your divine smite to help burn a target down faster. Validate that. Now we're leveling up our rogue. She's weak. Not surprising, 15 HP is not great. Again, slightly better than I think the Brother Mutant, but that's about it. Notice how we've unlocked Cunning Action. This is amazing. You can take a bonus action on each of your turns in combat. This action can be used only to take the dash, disengage, or hide action. She can basically double dash, is what we're telling you. She can fucking power sprint her ass to the other side of the fucking map and then stab someone in the fucking spine. This is really, really good for a level 2 upgrade. Now, notice at the higher levels, Rogue Arc types, we can specifically pick, again, all those three target types, and we are picking the one that makes us a Shadow Caster. Level 4, again, and same with level 8, we get the ability increase or a bonus feat, your choice. Level 5, we get uncanny dodge. Um, level 6, expertise, proficient with tools to double their proficiency bonus. That's awesome, and we get to pick two of those. That's fucking tits. And then we get evasion at level 7. So, again, she is a typical rogue. Going to be a badass. That's all she does. Notice how everyone's getting full HP and full uh, hit dice. So we've got two dice, two dice, two dice, and this one's got one right now because she hasn't leveled up yet. Now she has. She's got 20 HP. She's not quite as good as her paladin as far as health, but she's really strong, really dexterous all at the same time. That's something that our, our paladin didn't have. Um, let's see what else. Action search. We'll gain a main action immediately. Take a short or long rest to recover this power. Now pay close attention to the how fucking awesome you are as a fighter level 2. It's why I like making the spell sword. Because this is also something in Baldur's Gate 3. The action search. The ability for fighters to literally say, Nope, I missed on a fucking swing. I need an action search. I need to swing again. Or, I hit, but it wasn't enough damage. Action search. Boom, I can swing again. And level 2. Pop him in the face. Dude's dead. Problem solved. Easy peasy, pumpkin squeezy. This is an amazing ability. And then you throw in the fact that a short rest can get it back. Remember, that's just like taking a knee for like an hour. Not a full fucking 8 hour nap. And we can get jumped in the forest and all that fucking annoying shit and have to have food. No, if we just need to take a fucking short breather, hence a short rest, this recharges. So this is something that's really valuable. I'm not saying you need to use it like at every fucking fight or at the very first fucking opportunity, but it is something to consider. Because if you could take out a dude, let's say all right, we've got a team of four. Let's say you, you get jumped by five fucking guys, right? You're in the forest, you're walking onto your next destination and five rogue bandits, whatever, try to kick your ass. Fighter rushes up. Swing and hits, not enough to kill the guy, but action surges immediately and fucking kills the dude off. That's not demoralizing as far as I know in this game, but it is a powerful ability to fucking take their numbers and trim them from five to four, or whatever number we're talking about. Because again, we're even the playing field. And it's now this character that we just killed can't do damage to us anymore. Again, that's an amazing ability for us. Notice at higher levels, again at level three, we'll get our different archetypes. Again, spell swords what we're going for for her. We got our ability increase at 4 and 8, or bonus feat, your choice. We get extra attack at level 5, much like the Paladin. Notice at level 6 we get another ability score and, and or bonus, or sorry, or bonus feat increase. So again, we get it at, at 4, 6, and 8, and that's because we are a fighter. Another reason I love fighters. And again, no spells yet for either of those two. Level 3, they'll get that shit. That's it. That is all she wrote. Now let's actually get somewhere. Now we can actually go down and talk with some people. Oh, who the hell is this guy? Head launcher spell. What's up, yo? Clear skies, adventurers. Thought you had something for me, for me to talk about. Lord Karn. All right, so we can um, go to various places in town, and again, we have a tutorial that's telling us where we need to go. If I press J for journal. Uh, Quest log. We got level up. Did that buy some food for the journey? It's our main quest. Uh, right. Sounds good. Close you out. 
But again, oh, hey there, guys. This is going to be how you leave town. We don't want to do that just yet. Uh, as far as inventory is concerned, notice how everyone has their own inventory. Let's actually just reorder everything just to make sure that we have everything in a nice, steady place. Now, remember, she had the ability to craft. What was our crafting for that ship? Uh, scroll kit. This pendant is used to enchant items used using prime materials created by the ancient mana colon masters of magic. It is almost impossible to reproduce the rituals, but they may be completed by one who has the required skill and ingredients. Cool smith's tools, we don't have that. Uh, we have an herbalism kit. Uh, if we go to her, notice that she uh, suddenly unlocks her poison arrows, but again, we don't have the Galavan, Amaranth, and Blood Daffodil of this current power. We'll see if anyone else has it. Angry Violet, Abyss Moss, what did you get? Magnesium, Acid, Control of Revivify, very nice. Uh, what do you have? No, we do have rations, though, as you can see. We have rations here, one, 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 and he has one as well, and that's it. That's not a lot. So again, it's probably something that you're going to want to stock up on. There's also a quest in here, I want to say, to, to, to go to like a magic shop or some shit. Hey, yo. Clear skies, citizens. Hey, citizens. I too am a citizen. Thank you for noticing. All right, what we got? We got uh, here. I want to get jumped in the goddamn back alleys and shit at level two. All right, uh, where we at here on our map? We have Gorham, we got the Market Street, and we got fast travel. Oh, we got this Annie guy over here. One head over here because this is actually an interesting thing of the game that I'm a big fan of. Come and get it, guys. And we also got to talk to this dude, obviously, as well. Hence the exclamation point. Go talk to her. I'll be with you in a minute. Ah. So they not implement it yet? All right, let me yeah, do the story arc here. Crafting. It's a lot so you can craft various items. To do so, you need the proper equipment, ingredients, skill, and time. For magical items, sometimes you need to know spells. Crafting is performed while traveling. Once your party has set up camp but is not yet sleeping, characters can devote some of their free time to working on their current crafting task. Next. These are the tools required for crafting. Potions. Oh, you need an herbalism kit. Scrolls. You need a scroll kit. Poisons. You need a poisoner's kit. You're getting a pattern here. Enchanted weapons and armor. You need an enchanted weapons and armor kit. I'm just kidding. Man, that call Avalon Rosary. That's the one we saw a moment ago. You will need to be proficient with these tools to use them. Even if you're proficient with a given crafting tool, you'll still need specific skills to make successive checks against the recipe's DC. To craft potions, sometimes medicine is enough, but arcana is very useful. To craft poisons, medicine or nature is useful. To craft scrolls or enchanted items, arcana is a must. Crafting requires ingredients. They can be found while adventuring, gathered from flowers, bushes, and rocks, sometimes from dead creatures. Obviously, you can also buy them from shops, unless they are very rare. Enchanting requires prime items that have been magically prepared for enchanting by Manicolon uh, Master Smith, whose secrets have been lost with the Cataclysm. Generally, a primed item will require a very rare in additional ingredient to fulfill its potential. Finally, to craft an item, you need to know which ingredients to combine. These recipes can be learned by reading manuals or taught by masters. Solastin factions generally keep copies of recipes and sell them at good prices to their friends, but some can be found out there in the Badlands, too. Once the recipe has been learned, all the party can use it, so we don't need that extra scroll that we... Or, well, we recipe that we learned. Next, to start crafting, open the character screen and click on the crafting tab. Simply select a recipe that is available to start. To progress, the, uh, the progress bar will fill as you travel and you will be notified when the operation is over. So you can launch another one if you want. Remember that you can cancel a crafting operation, the ingredients, uh, so if you cancel a crafting operation, the ingredients are lost. Why the hell that cancel? I don't know. Hello, how may I help you? This is a magic shop. Okay, uh, what do you sell? What do you sell here? Mostly potions for heroic adventurers like yourselves. I also have recipes for customers who like to craft their own. And ingredients, too. Even rare flowers from the Badlands. Come back anytime. 
I'm almost always open. Let me see your wares. What you got? All right, so we got Hugo. Brother Mutant has this. She has that again. Um, ah, crafting scroll of Kirwan's We need to describe that for her. She has, though, the extra crafting basic poison. Sell it for 27. Nice. Is there anything we want to buy from? Let's look at. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, look at this. Detect magical auras on all items carried by party members, but does not reveal any item's function. So we can identify if something's magic for us if we have the ability to do so. Um, what we got? We got crafting stuff, scroll kit, herbalism, poisoner's tools. Crafting a scroll of magic. This will actually come in fucking super handy, but that's pricey. And we ain't got much in the way of cash. You know. uh, we have ingredients. Acid. Magnesium. Refined oil. Angry violets. Abyss moss. Galavan amaranth. We needed one of them. Uh, blood daffodil. I think I need one of those. Uh, and he has some other stuff that's just not in shop right now. He also has a brimstone viper scales. Who is that? Scales from a large flying snake from the balance. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm mean, we'll just go kill those things then. Uh, okay, again, we got crafting stuff. We have what's this? Adventuring gear. We have emeralds, diamonds, other bigger diamonds, and pearls. Nice. And I think pearls are a material component for various things. Be clear on that. Uh, we have potions. Uh, he has two potions of healing for sale. Um, he has antitoxins, scroll of magic missile, 55 bucks, man, Jesus Christ. Well, this would be, again, a way for us to actually get scrolls, uh, that we could probably scribe for our wizard. What do we got here? We scroll of thunder wave, cure wounds, yeah, no. Ooh, component pouch, this is important. Read this. Contains material components for most spells, costly components are not included. So when it specifically says... Uh, when we have a choice for our settings where we say we don't need components or we want components like the component pouch that's good enough or we can set it for the hardest difficulty which is the one where you literally must have the actual component it states so if it says you need pearl it's 100 gold pieces that's why he had pearls for sale at 100 gold pieces he doesn't actually have them but he could in the future that's why that's there so this is good enough uh, for most of our casting because i think i'm on the middle category uh notice that we have the arcane amulets same with this costly M, which is a small gem, has a main piece to be used as an arcane focus. Belt component pouch. This belt contains various pockets and pouches to store spell components. Easy to access. It's a must for traveling wizard. Nice. I'm assuming that's the same as the component pouch, but just a different kind. Uh, component bracers. These large bracers contain fast access pockets to store your mundane components. A must for wizards who like to travel light. Very interesting way of doing things and of course the arcane circle this is just another kind of spell focus so again taking up a different slot so to speak uh he doesn't have any armor for sale or any weapons for sale so we're actually good here let's conclude this anything else that we needed to sell probably don't need uh... that won't let us do that well she has four. We can pass some. And he has two. And he has a light spell. So we're actually going to sell her nine. It's not giving us a lot. But again, it's, it's money. Uh, so let's actually get out of here and do that thing. So here, I want to say you held shift. Nope. It's control. There we go. Control and drag it. And then you can actually break them into individual pieces like that. So now she has one if she needs it. Again, they have one already on her build right now. But it's nice that you have that ability to do so. So that's that. Uh, we also had... That must be his magic shop. You still don't want to talk to me? I'll be with you in a minute. Damn it, lady. Here we are. Welcome to Gorim's Emporium. Uh, are you Gorim? Are you Gorim? That's me, the one and only. What do you sell? What do you have to sell? 
everything you'll need for going out there into the Badlands. Food, ropes, torches, and of course, armor and weapons. I also have some other stock like remedies and antitoxins. That can come in handy. Ever heard of deep spiders? No, I haven't, and please don't tell me. Can you see your, uh, can we see your wares? Okay, so now here's our chance to buy stuff from her. So what would she have available? She has, again, herbalism kit, scroll kit, poisoner's kit, and she doesn't have a manco online rosaries. But we do have, or it just could be that we can't afford it. Maybe that's the key here. Then we got 99 books. Ooh, girl, what we got here? We got um, healing remedy. This is like a healing potion. It doesn't heal as much, uh, but it is helpful. Uh, we have ration pouches, so we're going to grab at least eight of them, don't you think? All right. Uh, and we'll pass those around so he's not overweight because he's terrible at carrying shit. Um, we can get more torches, but pass on that. Uh, these tools, don't need them. She has two, I think, already. We have candles. Again, uh, is this one of those placeable? Only lasts for an hour. Doesn't have a very good range. Bright in the one die that you're, or the one tile that you're in, and then dim light at one tile out. So basically, you'll affect all the tiles in a circle around you, basically. Um, we got here, we got potions. Potion of greater healing, my. Component pouch, again, we saw that with the other dude. We have different armor, we got leather armor, scale mail. Half plate is pricey as fuck, and so is chain mail. Chain mail's reasonable compared to that shit, Jesus. Uh, stealth disadvantage, notice that part again. Stealth disadvantage, stealth disadvantage, leather, no problem. And it's even telling us that he's not proficient with that particular item. Uh, we have plate, which is fucking right, target him on my. Um, I mean, and notice requires a minimal strength of 15. That's actually quite cool. I always hated when people make like min max builds and their strength is like fucking eight and they're still wearing full plate armor. Like, how the fuck are you moving, dude? You get knocked over on your ass. You can't stand the fuck back up. So I kind of dig that they did that shit. Uh, weapon wise, though, we have now long bows, more hammers, short swords, scimitars, rapiers, morning stars. Oh, fucking tits. Uh, long swords, great sword. Great axe, battle axe, short bows, light crossbows, spears, another course staff, maces, hand axe, daggers, clubs, that scimitar again? What the hell? Why do you got two scimitars? Oh, it must be his extras. Short sword, yeah. Uh, a full kit of uh, five of five, three of three. Here's some short swords, uh, long swords again, crossbow bolts, and arrows. Okay. I don't think we need any of that shit. Uh, we bought the, the stuff that we gave a shit about, and I'm good with that. Let's actually close out of here. Quest complete. Now, what's the next point? Uh, escape to the bandit's prison. These are all the things we've done already. Complete a quest. I think we're done here, guys. Map. Will you talk to me now? Deputies? Yes. A word, if you please. So Ooh, famous ah. already. <laughs> I love it. You were in there too. Are you a member of the council? I'm Annie Bagmorda, quartermaster of the Scavengers Guild. We don't have a seat in there, but they all know exploring the Badlands without us would be a bad idea. That's why you should stop by our headquarters downtown. You'll need our services, I'm sure. Is that compulsory? No. But you'll find our services useful. Everyone does. Did Lord Karen not tell you? No, he pretty much stuck to giving orders. Oh, right. Anyway, we offer plenty of help and advice to beginners like you. We are grown-ups, you know. At least, most of us are. Of course you are. Well, good luck. Scavengers, eh? I never knew if they were legit or not. I'd rather visit the temple, honestly. The scavengers. They've seen so much already. The first explorers of the ancient empire. So what do you think? Should we check out their headquarters? It's not far, but... I've had enough talking. Let's go kill some monsters. If there's business to be done, we can't afford not to. I like Brother Mutant. He's a money-growing piece of shit. All right, let's look at that. Oops. 
Quick shopping. In Emergent, you'll find a quick shopping interaction. This bypasses the discussion to instantly open the Merchant interface. You can still talk to the NPC Merchant if needed. That was the clicking of the fucking weird-ass uh, uh, tent, I guess. All right, so let's take a little bit of where they're at. Let's see, uh, where is it? Looks like right there. Let's just check this to make sure there's not something else. That's the way out. Lane in. Oh, wow, really go to the fucking corner of nowhere, huh? Um, this is um, Maddie Green, Green Isle. I haven't gone this way yet. Let's fucking go over here real quick. I like exploring myself. Oh, let's not go that way. Sorry, fellas. Yeah, nothing to see here. Uh, that's the edge. We can go up that way, but I really don't think there's anything there. That's probably the castle itself, because that's the council. So that's where the, the princess walked to. They're hoity toitiness. Let's go over here. And this is the reason we wanted to talk to this lady. So, uh, before we talked to her, just a, a brief aside. I've already seen this part because, again, I've seen this, uh, another YouTuber play this part. If this is implemented when the game is released, awesome. If it's not implemented now, I don't care. But this is something that is extremely useful and, and definitely something. I always thought it was missing from D&D. &D. Uh, they kind of hand wave it with a, a variety of ways. Let me explain. So what they are, they're scavengers. And as she'll tell us, uh, there's not enough of us strength-wise to carry all the fucking loot back. So take the best items that you need or, or you know, might need today, can you know, like potions and shit like that, and gold and so, so forth, and all the heavier shit you leave behind. When you get back to town, you tell the scavengers guild here and these scavengers will go back after we draw them a map and they'll fucking loot the place sell it and give us a cut okay so we basically do all the heavy lifting by killing all the fucking monsters and baddies in the area and then we tell them where the fucking shit's at and then we'll get a fucking small like finder's fee or some shit like that however that works i don't know but she's probably going to tell us this is something that i always thought was missing from D D. Because there's always one of those where, you know, like, oh, you got your tents, your floating desk, so you could, like, you know, pile your loot up to, like, well, how many hundreds of pounds you can pile on that fucker. And then slowly walk it back to fucking camp with a big floating invisible disc and, oh, fucking metric shit ton of fucking loot sitting right on top of it. Yeah, you're not getting jumped. Fucking really? So, it was a very silly idea. They tried. And then, of course, in D&D, &D, they also added, like, you can buy or rent, I should say, like, donkeys and pack mules and, and you know, the, the associated, you know, gear that they would have to fucking, like, you know, looting a place and putting it on their fucking back and fucking taking it back to town. Yeah, that's always a thing. But it still was always one where it's just, like, no one wants to do that shit. Um, we always house-ruled it, so we'd start doing stuff like, hey, you can fucking leave it here and... Uh, We'll do a, a cost analysis where we literally say, well, because you're leaving it here, someone could, by the time you get back with people to fucking loot the place, half of it could be gone or 90% you know, could be there still, you know, whatever. And we would fucking like roll on a table and say, okay, of the loot that was left behind, this is how many pieces are missing. Unless, you know, they took extra precautions to fucking hide it, you know, like they stuffed it in the fucking barrels of... of rice or some shit so that people are like, eh, rice, I don't need it. Turns out that's where the fucking uh, bag of holding, or not bag of holding, because you'd want to keep that, like your um, potions or whatever that you didn't want to take with you, you stored in the fucking rice barrel so that you could come back and, and reasonably find them again. So we would do shit like that. But this is really nice mechanic, and it wasn't uh, in the, the person that I saw doing this playthrough that, that talked about this. Uh, it wasn't implemented yet, so it may not be still. But hopefully it's definitely going to be there when... Or, oh, definitely. Hopefully it will be there uh, when the game is released next week. What up, yo? Ah, you came. You piqued our curiosity. So, what exactly do you have to offer? You don't know. Hmm. Do you sell healing potions? Do you sell healing potions? No, we don't. There's a shop for that. What help do you offer? What kind of help do you offer to people like us? Simple. Now, people like you typically carry out missions for the council. In the marches, even in the badlands. Sometimes far away, like Captain Merrin. Uh, who's Captain Merrin? <laughs> you really must be new. She's one of yours. Senior deputy of the council. Anyway. You trek out to some old ruin in the Badlands, kill a bunch of orcs. Well, you're still a bit green, so let's say goblins. Ouch! You're hurting our feelings. <laughs> orcs will hurt much more than your feelings, believe me. And stop interrupting, it's rude. So let's say 
You find yourself with a whole load of rusty swords, leather armor, shields, too much for you to log back here. Oh, so we're puny as well as green. Thanks so much. So instead, you brave heroes, just clear the place of monsters and draw us a nice clean map. Then we take our carts and pick up every piece of junk. We bring it back, we sell it, and we split the profits with you. We move the stuff, you go off to kill more bad things. Everybody wins. For a percentage, of course. What? You could never carry it all anyway. Not in your little backpacks. <laughs> See you later. Well, thank you. I guess that's it for us. Fine. Feel free to visit us any time. Or drop into any scavenger camp. Are there others? Anywhere we can settle. By the way, if you find Captain Henrik, tell him we're still interested. In what? In getting our people to care Lem. The outpost is perfect for us. Close to the Badlands, with plenty of space for our camp. Right. We'll tell him if we find him. That would be appreciated. The more you do for us, the more we do for you. Oh, so this business relationship can get better. And I hope it will, friend. I guess we'll see you around then. Sure. Good luck out there. And don't forget, in the Badlands, always keep your eyes open. Indeed. That's very cool. And again, I said I like that mechanic. I noticed that we have uh, storage shit here. I don't know that that's actually something we need to loot. Unknown content. Be sure to use a party stash, yeah, and then the Captain Marin stash, unknown content. So, well, let's go over here. It says party stash, unknown. Hey, unfinished biography in a Dragon's Den advertisement. Mine. Well, and I did say I wanted to uh, partial that shit out. Let's actually set that over to her because she is stronger. I don't want him being overweight. How are we doing on weight, by the way? She's at 102 maximum. Still not encumbered. She's at 78 maximum. She's still not encumbered. She's at 96. I mean, most of this is coming from her fucking armor. Notice how she does have a lawkeeper's badge. Uh, you're not supposed to wear it anymore, but this badge was once a symbol of your authority as a law enforcement deputy. Fuck you, I'm keeping it. And I like it. It's got a unicorn, I think, on it. Uh, we got, of course, backpack that increases our carrying capacity for how much store I think which is kind of cool uh, she's wearing chain mail she has crossbow bolts and of course a secondary crossbow weapon of course she has a torch she's wearing what leathers yeah light armor leather probably should have sold that fucking rapier because she ain't using that shit but I suppose I can give that to her and the reason that that matters to me is um, the type of damage I think there's hacking damage there's piercing damage is the arrow that you're seeing there versus the big axe hacking damage. And then, of course, there's the um, bludgeoning damage, which is probably what we'll get from his staff, I'm guessing. Yeah, bludgeoning damage, okay. Notice how it's versatile. A 1d8, which obviously is two-handed. 1d6 if you're one-handing that shit. Uh, notice how her uh, longsword is versatile. Again, 1d8 normally. 1d10 if she's you know, using two hands. She does not have versatile on the daggers. But they're finessable, and they are light, and they're thrown, which is awesome, because that means she can throw those fucking things. That's fucking tits. Uh, she has, a, again, also a longsword and, of course, the crossbow. So she has slashing and piercing damage on her build, so to speak. Um, let's do the armor class for that shield. That's not bad. All right. Uh, let's see. Let's get out of here. Journal update. What do we got? Convey the scavenger's message. Care of Lem main quests. You see outpost. Uh, we're tracking that quest. Okay, sounds good. Uh, now, at this point, you probably want to go to here, I'm guessing. This would be how we get out of town. Leave area. Proceed, sir. Uh, we are probably going to get you to the first place. There's probably going to be a, a generic fight. Use the arrow keys to explore the map. Click on the destination plane to travel. Your party will take some time to get there. While en route, adventurers can gather food by foraging or hunting. They can also find crafting ingredients and encounter travelers from remarkable locations or even monsters. A slow pace lets you move cautiously, trying to remain hidden from monsters. A normal pace is faster but riskier. A fast pace is the quickest of all but can be dangerous. 
Rangers will be very useful while in their preferred terrain. You will find more food and less likely to be surprised by monsters. Reason to make a ranger. You can set up travel so you don't need to micromanage your party. Whenever someone can level up, a long rest can be started immediately without finishing the day's travel. When a crafting task is complete, you can set up a new one without losing time. You can open the post-rest window after long rest, for instance, to modify your prepared spells. All understood. Oh, let's actually talk about that, though. How do we do that? Going that way. Oh, let's just take a quick zoom out and gander. We've got the Duchy of the South Marsh, the Duchy of the Western Fields, a Sand Reed, Duchy of Care Kaithlin, Duchy of the Eastern Forest, Duchy of Northern Plains, Duchy of Northern Hills, the Enarium. It's like a fucking green, green grove. Copperhead Road. And of course, the King or Carolina Outpost. This must be where all the nasty shit, the badlands are. I mean, look at it. It's fucking clearly bad. The Air LAA. That's how you pronounce that. Um, yeah, pretty straightforward. I wonder how big the map actually does get, though. So let's go to the Outpost. Travel. Uh, traveling pace. We got normal, fast, or slow. Normal sounds fine for me. Uh, default. Traveling settings. Default. Uh, interrupt when a character can level up. Interrupt when an item has been crafted. Interrupt when the long rest has been completed. That sounds all good. Cast a good berry spell when the long rest starts. See that? That's nice. Cast a great food spell when the long rest starts. So again, we can not waste uh, resources if we had those. Um, required rest to get there in three days is two long rests. Start traveling. Travel routine. Your heroes normally plan their travel so they are always fit and ready for anything. This routine requires them to travel no more than eight hours a day. It means enough time to eat and sleep and do count stomachs. And for other activities such as crafting, talking, playing games, playing an instrument, and praying. Travel fatigue. Sometimes the normal routine will be interrupted and your heroes will need to travel while they should be resting. This will add fatigue and may lead to exhaustion. Adventurers know how to push themselves temporarily and then return to their normal routine, limiting camping activities to get more rest so that fatigue is reduced. Do not let them get exhausted, as this can lead to terrible penalties. Understood. Oh, Shadowcaster kills a fellow a fallow deer. Fallow? Fallow deer? The party gains three food. Good job, Shadowcaster. Good bandits. Shadowcaster manages to collect crafting ingredients, blood daffodil. Good job, Shadowcaster. Shadowcaster's crushing it. The party comes across a messenger whose horse has been spooked. Shadowcaster calms the an animal and is gratefully thanked. We're fucking loving you on the team. Party sets camp. Devotee starts a game of dice. All right, uh, combat encounter. A group of hostile creatures has managed to surprise you. Uh, so, qualifies action and effects based on this ability score. Times three. Three of them, one of those. Um, surprise roll results. Oh, we're all surprised. Oh, that's not good. We got jumped, boys. We got jumped. Jumped in the forest. All right, we got four bad guys. Press on the key to start. So this will be your first official combat, guys. Oh, they're up on a fucking high platform, too. Surprise attack. You have been surprised while camping. You must fight off your attackers before you can leave. Having been surprised, you cannot take any action during the first turn of the battle. Surprise round. Don't hold back uh, your spells and powers. You will finish your long rest after the battle. So put all your strength into this fight for survival. That's really good advice here, guys. Next. This lets your character wait for a specific condition to be met. Uh, let's see what we got here. Oh, okay. This is the ready action. Um... Uh, so they can interrupt other characters' turns to perform the readied action. In Crown Master, you can ready an attack, depending on your character and their equipment and abilities. You can move, use a bonus action, and still use ready in action. This automatically ends your turn. So again, if we want to say ready a melee attack, for example, when a bad guy gets within range, we'll melee attack the motherfucker because we're waiting for him to fucking get to us. All right, surprise, 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 surprise. Yeah, we don't get a turn. Fuck us. Spry little bastards, ain't they? Come on down. Little banditos. There's the other two. Climbing off of rocks. Just getting out of the woodwork, ain't they? Alright, so we got a two handed swimming son of a bitch. I just saw that. And this guy's got what? An axe? No, it's a scimitar, clearly. All right, so we have Doofus number one. Where did Doofus number two go? 
Oh, right here. It was one and two. Unknown creature, unknown creature, which means we haven't encountered them before. You know, you never will. Highwaymen over here. Unknown creatures. So highwaymen, we obviously know a little bit about. Medium humanoid, hold all for more info. What we know about them. Armor class, we don't know. Hit point, we don't know. Move, we don't know. Tall and powerful, this bandit wields a great sword. One of four knowledge. Uh, quick to attack the target. You cannot reach the target. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so they're working their way to us. I say we deal with the shit that's uh, in our face right now. Notice how she's within reach of all of our characters. Remember, she has that defensive ability where if this motherfucker stays swinging at spell sword and she hasn't used her reaction, she can use her reaction to uh, provide disadvantage to the attacker. Which means they roll twice and they take the worst of the two results. Uh, this is Devotee's turn. And she can just straight up attack or cast a spell. And again, she can't cast spells right now because, again, she has uh, a sort of board going on right now. So we don't want to do that. We just want to say attack. Select the target. Kill that bitch. All right, now watch this. Devotee can smite her target with an additional damage by spending a spell slot. Again, remember what they told us in the tutorial. Your spells are going to come back. We're going to do a long rest after this fight's fucking over. So you might as well do that shit. Kill some stuff. You should have yielded. You should have yielded. You said you're just dead. And now I have your shit. I'm going to come over here and start flanking. She can't do anything else. Uh, cast spell as a bonus action. And again, shield of faith she could. But again, she has uh, her hands uh, bound. Uh, with a different uh, weapon shield. Alright, so now we have our rogue. Notice how she is in the red right now. Because this guy can basically see her. I go here though, she shouldn't be. And now she should be able to get some sneak attack love. Uh, let's do that, Jeff. Right. Sneak attack. Can you do it again? Yeah. Oh, and that guy's dead. Well struck. Uh, and now I'm going to have her go back to here. And we'll have her end her turn. Wizard boy time, and these guys are getting way too close to make me comfortable. Well, let's move him to here. And we're going to use a spell. What spell, you might ask? How about magic missile? Notice how we have uh, select target four targets, enemy creatures or objects. So again, it's a zero of four. So you, every time you click on something, you can basically add another target. So I can do two and two, one and three, three and one, all into one guy. Fuck that dude up. Yeah. Take all that damage, you bitch. And then uh, get the hell back here because I'm scared. And your turn. All right, spell sword. Now she could switch to a crossbow. Fuck that dude up. One well, critical miss. Oh, that sucked. All right, uh, can you switch back? No. Sure. I can do action search. Probably should have shown you that. Highwayman's almost dead, though. Another magic missile. That dude's toast. Uh, but might as well just crush him. Smite it. Yeah, I you're dead now. Kill you. Where's that doofus at? Right here. And your turn. Notice the pips for how far you can move. Again, another cool feature of this game. Oh, that's a dead guy right there. That's a resound victory. After a night attack, you can safely go back to sleep and complete your long rest. To do so, simply click on the, uh, click on the campfire. All your characters will receive their benefits of the long rest as normal. Cleric of the Oblivion Domain will peaceful rest. Will not be surprised in the future. This time was for the purpose of explaining the rules. So again, if, if we had that, which we don't, then that would have been awesome. So that's a really nice one to have, in my opinion. Now, we're not going to uh, go to rest right now. Remember, we have a team. And we just looted some, uh, or killed some bodies. So we loot some bodies. What you guys got? Loot all. Did we get it all? Looks like we did. Okay, back here. All right, let's actually take a look at that because looting it all probably went to yeah to him. All right, so uh, reorder that shit. You don't need that many rations. You give it to her. You don't need that many rations. You give that to her. You're not a great sword wielding son of a bitch. As a matter of fact, this will be um, hmm, chain mail. What are you wearing? Chain mail. What are you wearing? Okay, uh, we could pass this stuff around, but I got a feeling this is our first chance to start dropping some shit. Let's get rid of this stuff. Drop 
that. Copy you, the order, and close that. He's still overweight though, so we don't want that. Uh, drop that. He don't need a crossbow. He's got um. Uh, drop you, drop you. He has cantrips, so we don't need the great swords. You're that. All right, now he's back within weight. All right, click on the campfire. But it's entirely possible we could have the scavenger uh, camp come back here and pick up that shit for all I know. I don't think so because it's not a permanent location, but you never know. Uh, the party starts to rest. I prepare spells, just like always. And again, I'm cool with those ones. So validate. How about you? Again, no reason to change. Validate. Close it on up. Resume. Uh, didn't find any food. Managed to collect crafting ingredients. Angry Violet. Good job, Brother Mutant. Uh, so you can always interrupt your travel manually by pressing the interrupt button. This one right here. Um, then you can click on the character's portrait to open their inventory. Possibly start a new crafting activity. Change equipment or check anything you like. Just click the resume button to resume travel. Understood. Perform mental exercises. Praise. Read a chapter of a book. So you jumped. Oh, uh, nope, we're good. What was that? We have 11 food units. I like how it keeps track of our food over there so you don't have to fucking keep checking your inventory to find out if you're starving or you know, something bad's going to happen. So, this is the first official area uh, that your team should go to. Uh,. I think we might want to save this. This video is probably fucking hugely long already. Uh, so we'll probably save this on the next one. So let's just take a quick look at where we're at. Ooh, wow. It's a big ass fucking. So uh, that's Kerlem. We're almost there. It's just up the hill. It's a little too quiet, don't you think? We're in the marches. So quiet can't be trusted. True. Let's keep our eyes open. Good call. All right, so here we are. Let's scroll up just to show you some shit. There will be a fight up this path. We're not going to do that today. We'll do that tomorrow. Uh, and then up here will be the actual outpost itself proper. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a quick save here. And we're going to say, what are we going to call this one? Um, uh, at the base. Save it. Save. All right, that's all we got. We'll quit the game here. It takes us back to the main menu. But with that, my name is Brother Mute. Please like, subscribe, comment down below. Tell me what you guys think. What kind of team did you put together for your first run-through, guys? Uh, let me know down below, and I'll see you guys soon. Bye now.